Hello, and welcome to Mayor Brown's podcast, Credibly Challenged. This podcast focuses on risk management issues for financial institutions of all sizes, particularly those in the banking sector. My name is Matt Bazanz, and I'm a partner in Mayor Brown's Financial Services Regulatory and Enforcement Practice. Joining me today is a special guest, Bill Hulse from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. We're going to have a little different episode than we usually do today, because as you can hear, Bill does not come from a financial institution. In fact, he doesn't even come from a financial trade association. Instead, he is a senior vice president at one of the largest trade associations in the country, covering all types of entities out there from the commercial sector through to the financial sector. Uh, You'll hear more in a couple minutes why Bill is on this program and why he has an interest in bank risk management. But thanks, Bill, for being on. Matt, thanks for having me on. Happy to be here. So the big issue today that we're going to be talking about Uh, is banking policy, mainly around capital policy, that a few weeks ago, Bill and I were at a roundtable on uh, the Basel III endgame proposal that I think you've been hearing a lot of news about. And we were talking about why uh, a commercial organization like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is so focused on banking policy right now. Uh, Bill, could you give me a few thoughts on, on why this has become an issue for your group? So businesses of all sizes depend on the U.S. banking system for everything from a small loan to treasury management services to accessing the capital markets. Um, This is a major rule that will have a macroeconomic impact. In fact, the U.S. Chamber released a report just last week on how businesses view financial challenges, Basel III and beyond where we survey about 300 corporate treasurers and how they view the financial system and their ability to access capital. We survey small, medium, and large businesses on this. And while small businesses and large businesses sometimes have slightly different views on financial regulation, they all agree it impacts their bottom line. So in general, 87% of U.S. businesses reported negative effects from financial regulatory related cost increases. In other words, they see a cost passed on to them when there's a financial regulation imposed on their bank or their asset manager or insurance company. Um, 40% have reduced certain types of services to customers in response to financial regulations. And over one third of businesses are raising costs due to regulations imposed on the financial sector, causing operational constraints that impact their ability to provide services and invest. Now, this is just another way of saying inflation, which has also been on people's minds um, in DC and across the real economy now in in recent years. And regarding the Basel proposal um, that we're talking about today, Matt, we actually asked some pretty specific questions and got some pretty specific feedback. So 68% of respondents believe that a proposed net increase in capital requirements under Basel III would be damaging to their businesses. And this is especially heightened for SMEs. And 77% of businesses are concerned that investment grade private companies will be treated less favorably than investment grade public companies. And finally, 53% of businesses believe that the costs related to swaps can make it more difficult to manage risk. So you know, as you pointed out, this is a banking issue, but it is much more than that. This is really a business issue and a Main Street issue. Yeah, I think it's interesting that when we uh, look back at, at, you know, that paradigmatic um, movie, uh, It's a Wonderful Life, uh, where where we look at the two banks that were in the city. There was the, the Bailey Brothers Savings and Loan, and then there was the evil commercial bank that was trying to steal it. Uh, really, at the time, those uh, two banks or those two models of a savings association and a commercial bank Their main customers were mortgages for for home mortgages like uh, George Biddle's mortgage um, and and small businesses like the Main Street economy in that little town. Um, And even going back to when I was a child in the 80s, that that you still saw things like mortgage that were completely dominated by by banks. Um, And I would imagine it was in many ways similar for for the many small businesses among your membership. Uh, Today, though, as regulations like the 2013 Basel uh, capital increases have come out and, and other regulations out there, like how the Volcker rule raised swap prices, how Title VII raised swap prices, I think we've seen a, a, a pretty big transition of, of those sectors away from banks, where now banks make the minority of residential mortgages and, and even things like uh, small business credit is coming more and more from the non-bank sector. So I guess it 
that, that, that even though no one can say, oh, well, it's gone down, there are fewer mortgages being made, it certainly can shift around the financial ecosystem based on, on the weight of regulation. Um, were, were, th were these particular proposals that came out in July what you were expecting? So I think I'll, I'll say on your last point, at the Chamber, we believe in kind of the 31 flavors of capital. We believe banks play an important role. But we believe non-banks play an important role. But I do think it's fair to say that we've seen an increase in the amount of non-bank activity in this space and capital requirements and other regulations imposed on banks, you know, certainly might be the cause of that and should be part of the conversation. Um, in terms of you know, what came out at the end of July, so the Basel III proposal um, came out at the end of July, and I think to some degree, yes, and to some degree, no, it's not what we were expecting. I want to start with saying that we believe the Basel Committee is an important interlocutory body. Standard setting serves a valuable role to avoid market fragmentation and any regulatory race to the bottom, and the Basel Committee does a lot of great work. Um, U.S. regulations, however, should be fit for purpose in U.S. markets and adhere to U.S. law. And the standards developed by the Basel Committee are just that, standards. They're not a treaty. So our primary surprise is the rules are far from capital neutral. Um, Jerome Powell, Randy Quarles, and other regulators had stated for years that the amount of capital in the banking system is about right. You know, our second surprise is that the rules um, at minimum undermine and potentially violate the letter of the tailoring requirements out of the Economic Growth Act in 2018. Um, third, we were pretty shocked that U.S. regulators would again gold plate, as in go above and beyond, an internationally agreed to minimums for capital requirements, which could disadvantage you, um, banks operating here in the U.S. And then finally, we have quite a few process concerns with how um, U.S. banking regulators have gone about implementing the Basel III end game standard. I think it's interesting. I know you're going to get into more detail on it in a little bit later, but when, when you talk about the undermining the spirit of tailoring, the, the, that, that certainly is, is true that um, under tailoring, there were the different categories of banks that were established based on their size and complexity. And, and each of them had different uh, layers of regulation so that obviously the most systemically important, the, the USG SIBs, had the most regulation and, and then your uh, smaller, say, $100, $150 billion consumer bank had had the um, least enhanced regulation. They all had an enhanced level, but the, the smaller ones had the least enhancements. And um, what I thought was really interesting about the proposal is it even goes further in the other direction that it, for something like market risk, it says, even if you're a, a small regional bank who has effectively no market risk or, or no market risk, you still have to build the system to cal calculate market risk capital requirements as if you had a material amount of market risk. And so it's almost like the opposite of saying not only are we going to untailor the, the, the rules, we're actually going to say that people need to comply with rules that shouldn't even apply to them. So it's, it's almost going in the opposite direction. And I think that one, at least for me, was a, was a real head scratcher. But you're, you're the one who's been engaging more with, with the market on this. So, so what has been your biggest concern either that you've been hearing or that you've come up with? So uh, on your last point, that's, that's exactly right. You know, there seems, I keep hearing this talking point of, oh, well, these regional banks, if they don't have a significant amount of market risk, they're not engaged in the swaps market, for example, that they're not going to have to hold more capital. And that may be true, but from a regulatory compliance perspective, you're exactly right. They're going to have to do the modeling. They're going to have to come up with the internal frameworks and governance to ensure that they are remaining compliant with these regulations. And that has material costs around it as well. Um, and so I think one of the things um, you and I were talking about the other day, too, is just, you know, how we talk about capital and resolution in the United States and whether or not, you know, the proposal that came out in July was in some ways a reaction to some of the instability in the banking system earlier this year or overreaction and how that's coloring the debate in Washington. And, you know, there's been a lot of comments from Governor Barr and a lot of speeches saying that he's very concerned about those market events. I think we're all very concerned about those market events, but 
there has been little work done to connect those market events to the capital proposal that came in out in July. And I think there's been a you know different views and thinking too about just how severe um, those events were. And you know what you and I were talking about the other day is really need to revisit the conversation about what bank resolution in this country looks like. Like large companies in the U.S. fail all the time, and this is part of the risk taking that is inherent in our capitalist system. We work filed for bankruptcy just last week, Bed Bath and Beyond earlier this summer, household names. Would we panic if Caterpillar, which has over 100,000 U.S. employees, announced bankruptcy next week? I certainly understand these examples are apples to oranges, given the business model of banks and the role of the pub public sector and their stability. But there seems to be an increasing belief that banks are more important than these other types of companies. You know, the first big part of the conversation should be about if we are comfortable as a country allowing a large bank to fail. And there seems to be this belief that all large bank failures create financial contagion or that banks cannot be resolved in a way to limit financial stability risks. And that's just not the case. The resolution and sale of First Republic Bank, for example, which had over $200 billion in assets, is recent evidence that large banks can be resolved in a relatively orderly manner. Certainly, there was a lot of questions around that bank. Um, but in this case, there was no systemic risk exception invoked and all depositors were protected. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that even when there is a systemic risk exception invoked, like for the other two banks that failed, um, it's much different than bankruptcy. That when a corporation goes in into bankruptcy and goes before the bankruptcy judge and it, it has all of its debts listed and all of its assets and the either there it goes into liquidation, let's say, that the 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 people the creditors who maybe get pennies on the dollar dimes on the dollar they take a loss for the the amount that they don't get that if there's fewer assets than liabilities everyone gets back maybe 60 cents on the dollar and that that's 40 cents of loss that is borne by the private creditors that the bankruptcy court doesn't bear it the government doesn't bear it even the industry that the bankrupt company is in doesn't bear it but banking's a bit different that when the FDIC comes in and closes a bank in the normal course, uh, if there is a loss to the deposit insurance fund, in, in normal times, it would be made up through assessments over time on, on the other banks in the system. Um, so it would just every quarter, banks pay an assessment for their deposit insurance, and that accumulates in a fund managed by the FDIC. I think there's about a hundred-ish billion dollars in there right now. And yes, the FDIC has recourse to the Treasury, et cetera, but, but really that deposit insurance fund that's funded by the industry is the main tool. And then, like I was saying, for the systemic risk exception, that the FDIC is required to put special assessments on the industry. And so the FDIC has just finalized, I think, um, some assessments on the industry to make up for the losses caused by those two banks earlier this year. So in, in this case, it's one of the odd things of, not not only uh, did depositors get all of their money back, but the losses um, to that that the losses that those depositors would have borne shifted over to the private sector in a way that that would never be the case in in a, a corporate bankruptcy. Yep, that's right. And so, kind of begs the question then: if why are we why is the Federal Reserve proposing such a dramatic increase in capital? And there's kind of this question around what what is the risk of getting it wrong, and can you have too much capital in the banking system? Yeah. Well, what do you think about that? Could could you have too much capital? I mean, isn't more always better? So if you overregulate, you risk putting banks out of business. Again, apples are oranges, but if you were to require a company like Caterpillar to sideline significantly more cash, what would that mean for their ability to compete in the marketplace? You know, the global capital markets are highly competitive. It will not be easy or inexpensive for banks to raise the capital required under the Basel III rules. They'll be competing with each other and competing with all the other companies that are seeking capital in our markets, all of their competitors and peers and other companies that you know might have a good return in equity. So banks will ultimately be able to raise the capital, but at what cost? You know, will they significantly reduce lending to other parts of the economy that maybe aren't as profitable, or will they raise costs on their customers to regain some of these costs? Um, it's one or the other. 
Um, by no means am I suggesting arguing against capital, the banking system, but there should be an understanding that the principle of diminishing returns is applicable here. Mm -hmm. All sh policymakers should be striving towards the optimal level of capital, not just more capital for more capital sake. So I think a lot of us here, like you said, are familiar with with lending and and the uh, the potential effects of of capital regulation on lending because you know the two are are so intrinsically tied. But maybe thinking about some of your policy concerns around some of the other less less frequently discussed risks, um, and let's start maybe with market risk that. Uh, they are expected to be some of the most significant increases under the proposal in in absolute, uh, per, I guess, in in percentage terms, um, and and market risk. At least I, I've been doing this uh, over ten years, and and it almost never comes up because it's it's that kind of thing that that you know those those big banks do with some really smart mathematicians inside. And, and so even a lawyer like me doesn't see a whole lot of market risk. But can you tell me a little bit about how how that market risk trickles down to your commercial members? Absolutely. So the market risk capital requirements go up by a staggering maybe 70 percent. Certainly depends on the bank and their activity. But for most banks active in the capital markets, it's material extremely. So just a few examples of kind of the things that our member companies are, are concerned about and we're educating them about. So think of what this means, for example, for corporate bond market liquidity. If you have fewer banks buying and selling corporate debt, you'll have less liquidity and the market's going to pri price in a premium. Um, that premium ends up being borne by the issuers of that debt. The, whoever is holding those securities is going to demand a slightly higher yield. We're also thinking about this a lot in terms of what it means for hedging instruments, so futures and options markets. Um, kind of outside even just the corporate context, there are 50,000 farmers in the United States that use hedging instruments, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So they're using these instruments to hedge for all sorts of different events. What's it mean if the livestock that they plan to bring to market next year isn't as strong as they inspected, or what if there's some sort of weather event? You know, what is what if there's some sort of geopolitical risk? For example, there are you know multiple wars raging in the world right now, and what's the effect of the war in Ukraine and the green markets? Like there are just so many examples here that companies are really hedging around, just in the agricultural space. And if these instruments are more expensive for them to use, or they're less available, they're going to be less likely to hedge, or they're going to have to pay more for them. Um, so that's a real cost. You could also talk about the examples too for like interest rate swaps. You know, this is more in the, in the financial space to companies that are exposed to interest rate risk. But if you're a large life insurance company, you have a lot of interest rate risk, and you know the availability of interest rate swaps is going to be important to you. Um, or even just think of if you're a if you're an airline or like a regional trucking company, you need to hedge the price of gas. So you're looking at you know crude oil futures. Um, again, material to the business. This is one of their primary inputs. And if they can't have some stability and expecting what their costs are going to be next year, either putting some sort of like floor or ceiling around that, how can you plan as a business? Um, you know, these examples go on and on, um, but they really are material. I, might, I see a, a physical therapist and, and she was saying that uh, she and her uh, fiance have to move from their apartment complex because the the rent went up three hundred dollars a month, um, and, and you know I, I'm I'm sure that that apartment landlord isn't happy about having to raise the rent. It's a, one of those large corporate owned properties, uh, and and if they had an interest rate swap in in place on on that mortgage, you know maybe they wouldn't have had to raise it so much on her and and lost her as a good tenant. Yeah, absolutely. I mean that is that is a great example of how. This isn't just a just just a business issue, but also there are plenty of businesses that you know they aren't they aren't renting an apartment, but maybe they're renting a floor of a building or they're renting out some sort of warehouse. Um, these costs are going to go up if they yeah. can't hedge it, or their you know their landlord's not hedging it. Someone needs to someone needs to pay for the for the difference. Yeah, there is no free lunch. One of the harder risks, um, I think, to to conceptualize for for many is, 
this new one around operational risk, which I've often said is 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 the risk of something bad happening, be it a bank branch burning down or an ATM network being hacked, that those are all of the kind of things that that are operational risks. But maybe maybe you could tell us about your concerns with with putting capital requirements on that. You're right. This is an entirely new capital requirement, and I think that's made it a little bit difficult, at least thus far, for people to envision how to implement it and what exactly it's supposed to do. So the incentives here seem pretty odd. It requires a bank to hold capital against you know, challenges they expect in upcoming revenue or expenses, uh, You know, either a drop in revenue or you know, some sort of expenses um, instead of making investments to prevent them in the future. So, you know, if you had some sort of losses related to, as you said, your ATMs in the last 10 years, um, you have a sense of what those might be going forward, and there's a multiplier against that, and then the bank is required to hold that much capital. Better yet, it would seem, would be to take that cash and invest it into fixing the ATM network so you don't have those expenses going forward. Um, much better to just not realize new expenses instead of just expecting them and, and paying them out. Um, but this capital requirements, especially punitive on products that are more reliant on fee income. And this is a good reminder that banks do more than offer credit products that generate interest income. Um, so there's kind of quite a few examples in this space, but one example is, you know, a small business credit card. It's, a, you know, the operational risk requirements are especially punitive to unused lines of credit. Banks will likely either have to decrease these credit limits or maybe add on some other fees to recoup these costs. Um, the prettiest punitive to capital markets activity. So think of an, a company that wants to IPO. There's no interest income there. The bank needs to do the underwriting. It needs to do the marketing and potentially hold this on the balance sheet. And there's risk there. And the you know, great thing is company gets to go public, um, mm -hmm. but they're also potentially operational capital requirements that would come into effect here too, that would make it so banks want to do less of this or charge more. And finally, this matters in the asset management space. Even just think of a small business that depends on a bank to help them manage their finances and make sure they're not just set up for the short term and medium term, but also making appropriate investments with their cash in the long term as well. I think I think some of these um, almost perverse incentives that the proposal creates are 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 fascinating to to consider if the the regulators really thought about it. Like coming back to the credit card point that there are a number of features of the proposal that are are likely to lead to banks reducing credit limits for customers of all types, commercial and consumer. And in, in the commercial space, like you explained, that can be a bad thing. But in the consumer space, it, it's also a bad thing because what what is our credit score based on? You, you know, the credit score when I pull up the, the little uh, calculator on my on my credit card, and, and it, one of the driving factors of it is my utilization, the amount of credit I'm utilizing relative to, to the overall credit I'm entitled to. And you know, one of the rules of thumb I've always heard is try to keep your monthly utilization under 7%, or if it goes above 10%, it can start having a negative effect on, on your credit score. Um, and, and so if, if we're telling banks to cut people's credit limits, that's effectively pushing their utilization up, which will then push their credit scores down. And so I, again, that, that, that's just one of those counterintuitive points to the proposal where it's like, did someone really think through that, say, by disincentivizing banks from offering securities brokerage, we might lead to the reintroduction of, of, of trading fees right now? Like I, I pay effectively no trading fees on, on my, my, my brokerage account. Um, is it, it's a little consumer brokerage account. Nothing, no one really cares about it. But if we went back to having uh, commissions on each trade because that was how the the bank felt they needed to offset the operas capital charge, what, is that what really what consumers want? I don't think so. Um, and but you know, great examples just about how this is not just a banking issue. Like if you change the economics of banking. And you change the incentive structure, you know, banks are going to have to respond accordingly. And it gets back to 
theme I've been trying to hit on throughout this podcast is you're either going to get less of what these banks are offering today or they're going to have to charge a higher price. Now, you've you've thought about this a lot, I can tell, because you you, you know, you, you guys wrote this report. You've sent letters to Congress and other groups. Um, but for, for your members out there, for the people who only see the end result of this in, in the, the new little insert to their, their um, uh, business credit card saying the rate has gone up, um, what are you doing to, to educate the, that part of Main Street business? Yeah, absolutely. So we're directly engaging with companies in our membership so they're educated on these issues. Um, we want them to understand that their financial options may be more limited or expensive in the coming years. Um, today, we're launching a nationwide effort to drive public attention to this issue. Um, we're running digital ads in DC and soon in numerous states. Um, we have a page on the Chamber's website, uschamber.com slash finance, dedicated to this issue. Um, we're also starting to work with our Federation of State and Local Chambers so business leaders in every community can be more engaged. Now, one thing I remember, because I, I very briefly was at the the SEC in their um, uh, their risk analytics division, I think it's called DIRA now, um, and and it, it, you were a legend in, in their hallways because uh, you had won uh, several uh, court cases against them for improper rulemakings, um, and, and they have a very, very strict economic analysis requirements hard coded into their statutes. And, 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 and I think that was one of the really other than maybe the FDA tobacco cases, that was one of the first cases where, where the courts came so firmly down on an agency saying, you got it wrong um, and, and you need to go back and do your math. Uh, and, and, and so, the, so again, you, you had quite a reputation around there. There was an entire division created in, in response to, to remediating the, the errors that were pointed out through your litigation. Um, I, I've heard lots of things being thrown around um, are, are you guys looking at at litigation as a, as a response to Endgame? So appreciate the uh, first of all, appreciate the compliments about our previous um, you know legal challenges to um, financial regulations in the past. And as you mentioned, we have a first in class litigation team at the chamber. You know, here we effectively have an in house law firm that sits right next door to me, and they do great work. They have a stellar record in court, um, and my team at CCMC has partnered with them on numerous issues. So notably, two weeks ago, the Fifth Circuit ruled that the SEC had failed to complete an adequate cost-benefit analysis on its stock buyback disclosure rule. Um, previous lawsuits from the Chamber against the SEC, including on the agency's conflict minerals disclosure rule, set really important uh, precedent for SEC's use of cost-benefit analysis. and. There were a number of years in there where the agency had approved its cost benefit analysis and we praised it. Um, the SEC, however, did not follow the right process and adhering to those requirements with that stock bag back disclosure rule in our view and in, in the view of the court. Um, so it relates to you know the, the Basel through Endgame proposal. I'll say that we never decide to sue an agency before we see final rule, never. However, you know, in this case, we've laid out some serious process concerns and made some pretty strong arguments around the need um, to conduct a robust cost benefit analysis. And we would expect for those to be addressed by the federal banking regulators throughout the rulemaking process. Um, otherwise, you know, we'll have to revisit this conversation. That makes a lot of sense. And I think it's interesting when you look at a document that it's uh, over a thousand pages long, and and for those uh, you've been doing this even even longer, but you, you know how in those thousand pages there's a great deal of repetition. That there's the the rule text, and then there is the summary of the rule text, and the summary of the summary. And so w when you get down to the actual new content, it's the kind of thing that 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 uh, people like you and me go through and like, oh, here's here's one sentence that says something. I wasn't expecting it to like, let me let me grab onto that. And and so while it's 1100 pages, there isn't actually a, a lot of um, new content or new analysis in there. Um, the, there. There's a similar long term debt proposal that's out there right now. And I, I think it's interesting to to contrast that, that, that in that long term debt proposal, there was a, a four page discussion of why the banking regulators set the minimum denominations for long-term debt at four hundred thousand dollars, 
And they went through their math of looking at the average size of an asset management account, and they had footnotes to different uh, publications. And 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 I was like, oh, this is different. This is this is uh, this is way more informative than than really anything I'm seeing in the end game one. And it was around just one point of the long term debt. And so I. I really couldn't imagine what like we're, we're going to have some great comments on on the end game, but I couldn't imagine what how much better they would be if we had things like that to analyze for for all of the parts of end games that that, that would have been a, uh, a maybe a maybe you've taken away from Christmas for me, but it would have been a nice present. So. Yeah, I think uh, this regulations, you know, it's incumbent on the federal regulators in this case and in other cases the, to justify their rule. Um, we aren't saying no new rules. We aren't saying, you know, no capital increases. We're simply saying, please tell us why and please show us your math. So we can have an honest discussion about whether or not um, this achieves the you know, optimal level of capital in the banking system. Great. Well, Bill, I really want to thank you for joining me today. This has been a, a great conversation and, and always appreciate um, getting a little commercial perspective in, in into the stuffy banking world. Um, I also want to thank our, our listeners. Without you, we wouldn't have a reason to do this program. Um, and so from us here at Mayor Brown, incredibly challenged. Thank you and have a great day.